everybody. Welcome to Q and A's on a Tuesday. As Francis has your questions. She's going to shout them out, and I'm going to try and answer a few. Francis, uh, we've got one from Julie Rampke, which is specifically for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you describe the process it took to plan and arrange an episode of Time Team? Um, that we did have people, researchers, associate producers, who did a very fine job, which is a real headache. Um, whenever you go to a site, uh, Jim, Jim Mower is one who I still keep in touch with, and Jim did a fantastic job for us. Before we go to a site, we had to clear all the paperwork permissions. We had to check the site to make sure it wasn't a scheduled ancient monument. We had to do things like find out if there was a gas main or a water main. We, we, uh, on, on the odd occasion, we occasionally clipped a water main that we didn't know was there. All that paperwork had to be done. And the local county archaeologist and English heritage, and, all, and in, the, in the case of Wales, Cadu, which is the sort of equivalent there, had to be sure about what we were doing and that all the paperwork was in place. It was a big job. And when you take a big official site, we once dug at Westminster Abbey, for instance, the amount of paperwork and committees and other things that have to be sorted out before we went there was critically important. So my hat is off to all those people who did that work for 20 years, because um, I'm sure it gave some of them quite a headache. Julie is also wondering whether or not there was a mobile reference library kept on site. Well, the nice thing, again, we would have a couple of researchers and it was their job to get whatever books we might need. And if we didn't have them, they would rush off to the local, um, the local library and get a reference. Nowadays, of course, you just sit on Google and tap away and there it is. In, even in the time of the Celtic Spring, we had to actually bring together experts who kind of knew their stuff. Um, we had Miranda Green and, and these experts come onto Time Team and they're on there for about 5, 10, 15 minutes. These are some of the best people in the world at their subject. And in a sense, we don't have a library, we have our experts. And, and on this site, we had Richard Rees, who's a genius about Roman sites. We had Ian Stead, who came 400 miles to do that sword. And we had Miranda, who was a real expert at sanctuary sacrifice sites. And, and she's got a rather wonderful, one of my favorite books is a book that she wrote about sacrifices and it's well worth reading. So in a sense, we had our own library. Robin always used to turn up with necessary paperwork, big tomes, particularly about the, the wonderful antiquarian that he found. Um, so in general, a time team, uh, the time team incident room that you see on the program was stuffed full of books. But you know, I could guarantee you that always with time team, something would turn up that we didn't have the answer to. A famous example, which hopefully we'll get to see at some point, is a, is a piece of Ogham writing which turned up on a site. And none of us there could make head nor tail of it. So we phoned up the person who was the, who was the expert in Ogham and that managed to solve it. Time Team had a huge network of friends and it was one of the lovely things. We would ring somebody up and we would say, we've got this problem and they would get in their car, get on their train, travel miles and miles to come and try and help us sort things out, which was, which was a real fantastic luxury. When you talk about local libraries and things, one of the things I remember, and I think Steve has got a nice photograph somewhere that actually didn't make it into the program, was that we wanted to x-ray the sword. And Steve and one of our diggers, Katie, disappeared off to the local vets because that was the nearest place and Steve and Katie were sat together in the vets you know with a row of animals in front of them waiting to put our sword into the kind Welsh vets uh, who managed to x-ray it for us um, so we're there we use all lo local resources we can and uh, it's one of the fun things about time team we don't know and Stuart had to go off to a local supplier of barbed wire to make all those wonderful comparisons, a very Stuart type thing that was. And that was great fun, you know, the, the comparison of different types, the typology 
is the archaeological name for it. And that typology sorted out gave us a really important clue, as I think you can tell from the programme. Well, Lynette Smith has actually got a question about the barbed wire, and she's asking, if the barbed wire hadn't been underneath the sword, what conclusions would have been made? Any piece of barbed wire round an Iron Age sword is problematic, to say the least. Um, if it had been under it or over it or what have you, the important thing about that point, which I'm sure you've got now, is, is the idea of stratigraphy. And if you can have a good intact stratigraphy, then you have the greatest thing of all, which is a fantastic context for that site. If you dig down and find your sword or Roman pottery and you find a bit of blue and white ware there, then you've got to ask yourself, how did that get there? Sometimes stuff gets churned up, but by and large, a strong stratigraphy is what you want. And a piece of barbed wire remotely near an Iron Age sword would always have been problematic. We've got a question from Claire McElroy, and she's asking, why did you dig the site? Did you suspect that there was something off about it all along? I think we became intrigued. I mean, it was partly what Mick and I used to call a, a small perversity. Um, we noticed how the local archaeologists were worried and sort of didn't really want us to go there. And, and I think part of us thought, well, OK, well, let's do it. And I think we were confident enough in our own set of skills, all those skills you saw on the programme, to actually take on something that was that sort of mystery. Um, we, we, uh, we went to the site with a relatively open mind, I think, and that was very important all the way through. What we were trying to do was just say, here's the evidence, and then convince you as the viewer exactly what you think is going on. And that was quite a, a good way to approach it, I think. We weren't constantly saying, well, who did this or who did that, or was it the antiquarian or whoever? We were perfectly happy to take each piece of forensic evidence, put it up there and go, uh, this seems to be wrong in some way. So you make up your own judgments. And, and exactly why it occurred and who it had been part of it was kind of less of an interest. Michelle Hunter is wondering whether or not anybody has since owned up to the planting of the artefacts. Um, uh, yes, Michelle, I suppose, you know, people get very sort of interested in that. We were less interested, I think, in that. We were less interested in the who of it than the how of it. And, and I think we'll leave it to your conclusions. We've got a question from Michael Luke, who's asking whether there were any items that were found that didn't make the final cut of the programme that are worth commenting about. Yes, thank you for that question, Michael. I think um, it was an interesting part of the way the programme developed was that by the end, um, we showed everything. There was virtually everything there because it was part of what we were trying to do. It was what Richard Rees and Guy de la Bedwire, Guy's a wonderful uh, Romanist friend of Time Team and, and he's written some fantastic books on Roman Britain. To have Guy and Richard there, looking at all those objects. It was seeing the spread of them and that bizarre detail, which I remember to this day, that if you put an object in a mildly acidic soil, you know, somewhere on chalkland, and you put another object in an acid spring, then the two things don't look the same color, don't have the same pitting on them. And laying all that stuff out for you was part of, of, of the way we wanted to handle the show. So uh, I am fairly sure that you saw everything um, uh, that was there to see. And it was, by the end of it, there was a huge amount of stuff laid out, um, but it was exactly what we got from laying it out that made it important to show it to you. Michael also asks whether there are any mainstream archaeological sites which at the time were outstanding and then were later found to be fraudulent. I think very few, really. I mean, we certainly didn't get invited to them, let's put it like that. After Celtic Spring, I think you'd have to be pretty daft to, to ask our guys to turn up. 
One question that crops up quite frequently on Facebook is um, not particularly archaeological, but what was the dog's name? Can you remember? Um, I can't. Uh, to be honest, in the middle of all that, I was lucky to remember my own name, let alone anybody else's, although maybe somebody out there would be able to tell us. Oh, the other thing I should say was that it was a lovely thing that the director, Mel, and Victor did between them to have that end of part erase, er, erasing of the sight in front of your eyes. There goes the Neolithic stones, there goes the Norman Hall. I thought that was a very nice um, bit of um, television artifice, if you like. We've got a question from Toby France. And he's asking, what is the difference between a folly and a fake? Well, Toby, um, I'm not really a buildings expert in that way, but I think if, if I wanted to try and give you an answer, it would be a folly is, is often something intentionally created, usually by people of leisure on large estates, which improves their view of the landscape. There's a lot of places where the stately home sits there and the chap or whoever it is, the lady of the manor, the lord of the manor is looking out and they think it'd be rather nice to have a crumbling ruin existing there. And in fact, there was a tradition of this. Um, places like Starhead um, have got an entire landscape of the most stunning follies. Um, you know, ancient Roman remains, Greek temples. And there definitely was a period where you wouldn't um, recreate a, a complete uh, building, but you would have something that looked like a crumbling ruin. And it was a rather romantic nature. And, and I would call those sort of follies because they were deliberately created. They were part of a park. Everybody knew that when they'd been built. Fake is somehow where people are trying to suggest that it, they've just discovered an ancient place. And, and at that point, they better be very sure they've got their stratigraphy right uh, if they're trying to prove it. And it, it's relatively rare, I think. Larissa Spiker is asking whether the sword would have disintegrated in the soil over time had it not been found. Yes, that's a good question, Marissa. Um, that sword sort of been placed in a very corrosive environment. There was a lot of um, runoff from the local cow shed into that spring. And I think if we'd have had time to do an assessment of the acidity of it, it would have certainly been fairly high. And you put something like that, which not only had the sword, but also had a handle, there's a good chance it had already deteriorated quite a bit. And some of that detail would have been lost. Um, we've had quite a few questions sent in from Judy Rampke. Um, but one of the ones that we've not answered, or you've not answered, is do you have any idea of what the monetary value of all the objects found on the site were? Really, one of the nice things about Time Team, really, was that we didn't have to worry about monetary value. Uh, it, it was sort of the last thing we were thinking about, which was kind of a relief, really. Um, we've got a question from Susan McDonald who wants to know whether the gentleman who owned the property at the time that the show was filmed lived there when the house was built? Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, Susan. Um, I, it was some relief, really, that I think we kind of felt we would leave the, um, what would you call it, the progression of ownership of the farm in a film that's this length with so much complexity there was quite a lot that, that didn't actually make it into the film and i think we just didn't have space to go into the um into the into the heritage issue of the farm and one thing and another there was much too much interesting going on occasionally we do that you know the study of genealogy can be an important part of a question we're trying to answer but in this case there was enough going on without it Eve Jones has sent in a number of questions on Facebook, um, but one thing that she points out is that it did make her feel quite suspicious um, when the landowners were being interviewed. Did it feel strange at the time? I think it's it, the whole shoot was strange and tense, and, and, and the further we got into it, the tenser it got. 
and and I think some of the reactions to us being there and, and trying to arrange uh, to talk to people about things was so difficult that it, it was it was odd and it was very strange to cope with although you know you have to say at the end one of the gentlemen did sit down with Tony which can't have been an easy thing to do so um, you know I sort of uh, think he was quite uh, brave to do that. Go on. Now, Eve, Eve Jones is also asking, um, well, she said she was a bit confused about the spring not having been there before 1972. Can one <laughs> create a spring? <laughs> yes, yes, a, a good question, Eve. Uh, the answer is you can't, it's very difficult. Um, it must be quite alarming if, if you're trying to tell a story about wherever you live and you've got someone like Stuart examining the map sequence, regressive map analysis. Mick used to say a glass of wine, a pen and a set of maps. And you go back and you look at each one and you see that on the map in 1970, there wasn't anything there on a map between 1840 and 1890, there was no standing stones. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting analytic. I always wish I could write a detective version, a sort of Wallander with archeology, span because sometimes when you're trying to unlock the secrets of that, those are the skills you need to prove. And you've got to prove it not just to yourself, you've got to prove it to the court of public opinion. You, you've got to nail your facts down. And we soon realized that all of us there were not going to be able to convince anybody unless we were 100% true, certain about what we were finding. I think all power to Stuart's elbow on that one. He did a rather good job. Leslie Keach on Facebook is asking, what are Barney Sloan and Jenny Butterworth up to now? They're two of their favorite diggers. Ah, good question. Well, what was the person's name who asked the question? Leslie Keach. Leslie. Barney now is, is extremely senior in English heritage. Um, and Jenny had a wonderful career making history documentaries. And uh, she's still pursuing archaeology and history now. Um, I'm not sure in which capacity. Maybe she'll contact us and tell you. Um, it's quite fun sometimes. We remember these characters as sort of field archaeologists, diggers, and they now have risen to some sort of senior position. And we can ring them up and we occasionally say, we've still got the photographs, you know, from the, from the shoot. Um, I remember some of these people, one of the first digs we did at Much Wenlock, we were staying at Mark Horton's house, and we couldn't afford to put the diggers into hotels in those days. And most of them, I think Jenny amongst them, was sleeping on the floor of Mark Horton, Professor Mark Horton's kitchen. Um, and we used to pick them up in the morning looking slightly the worse for wear. And always at the end of the day, we would take them to the pub and make sure they were look af looked after. So some of those people go back a long way and without them, uh, we couldn't have done it. To trust that team of people you, they would let you know, and I, I think you saw in this film, it was Jenny, I think, who first, Jenny and Carenza, who first got that idea of there was something not right about that sword, and, and they were absolutely right. So very important people, and Barney, uh, not quite as glamorous as the Anglo-Saxon sword, found the marmalade pot, um, and uh, which solved the Norman Tower. So yes, lovely people, and uh, um, they've gone on to do wonderful things, which is great. Mark Vernon Freestone is asking, why did you decide to dig the site when so many local archeologists thought it was a fake in the first place? Was it an exercise to show us how archeology span works? I think there was a certain, occasionally Mick and I used to call, call things a small perversity that we decided to do something. There was something about people telling us we shouldn't be doing it that made us interested. Um, and then we kind of felt, well, if nobody else will do it, then we should do it. We felt confident enough in each other's skills to risk going into what was a, quite a difficult situation. We've had one sent in from Jennifer McDonald, who would like to know, what happened to all of the items that were found? And did you discover where they had originally come from? 
Um, with any time team, all the objects we found have to be very carefully um, uh, put with the local museum or wherever the county archaeologist wants them to go usually. So that, that would be with the local museum. Um, the, we, we would not do a program unless we knew where what was going to happen to what we found. Um, there are some difficulties around anything like those objects because where they have come from, the provenance of those objects was really the, one of the main points of the program. We, as Tony says very effectively at the end, there's two things went on. Objects had been removed from sites which mean they could no longer tell us anything about all those sites. And they're then put into another site, which may well have gone on the record of, as being a rather interesting spring or whatever. And those two things, I think, at the heart of that programme were very important. And it meant that it was almost impossible for us to tell where some of those original objects had come from. They may have come from hundreds of miles away and we know that the sword effectively came from Switzerland so God knows how that got there um, but that was the thrilling thing about the program. Next question. Colleen Hunter is asking could the sword have been stolen and hidden from a collection? Could that explain why it was out of place archaeologically? I think that's something that we can't uh, give you an answer to to be honest. I think how that stone got there, uh, all we can say is that stone at some point in its life was in Switzerland. And it wasn't unusual in the 19th century for people doing the grand European tour to sort of pop off to the lakeside villages, the Laten lakeside villages, and, and come back with um, a, a suitable memento of the journey. So I hope that's given you some idea uh, I hope we've answered a few questions and I haven't been rambling too widely. Um, thank you for sending them in. Very nice to hear them. We've got a rather fantastic program for you for next weekend again. And I hope you're keeping safe and I hope you enjoy Time Team once again next Sunday. And we'll be telling you which one it is Friday tea time at six o'clock.